Fixate on Code, Episode 10. Oh yes, Larry Porter here and you're listening to Fixate on Code, the weekly bite-sized podcast where I talk to the best devs about their favorite strategies for writing great code. And today we'll be chatting with Kyle Simpson. Kyle, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. Kyle has a simple recipe for developer success. Understand the problem before you try to fix it. With Kyle's widely read You Don't Know JS book series, learning JavaScript more deeply is something every developer can and should take on as a challenge. Not only is Kyle an author, but also a teacher, speaker, and chronic contributor to the world of open source software. Kyle offers corporate training workshops for JavaScript and is currently working on a new startup to take developer education to the next level. Kyle, can you fill in some of the gaps in that intro and tell me a little bit about what you get up to when you're not writing code? Sure. I um, Let me start with the second part of that, what I do when I'm not writing code, um, because you do need, I think, to have um, interesting other social interests and, and so forth to uh, kind of keep you well-rounded. I have... Um, uh, an interesting, I, I guess you would call it a hobby of sorts. Um, I play ping pong, but it's not quite <laughs> like what people might think. Um, oh, let me let me say table tennis, I guess is the official term. Um, <laughs> but it's not quite like what people might think where you just, oh, okay, well, I play at the office or I play, you know, in my basement or garage. Um, I, I take it a little bit more seriously and um, I have a coach. I take lessons multiple times a week. And I'm not really um, competitive, like I'm not in the tournament scene or whatever, but I, I really enjoy it. And we play pretty intensely. I play for three or four hours at a time, uh, drenched in sweat. Um, but I love I love table tennis. It really engages a lot of your brain. Um, and it's a fantastic exercise, both physically and mentally. So um, that, I play some golf as well, although not nearly as intensely as that. And... Um, and I like to hang out with people and have chats um, about stuff that is very different from the way I think about stuff. I have a group of people that I meet with. Um, we meet every Friday morning in, um, in when I'm in Austin. Uh, they, they meet all the time. I shouldn't say it's my group. I just go to this group. Um, we meet at a coffee shop every Friday morning. And the only thing that we have in common is that we all meet there. Uh, everything else, we're different. Um, and we just chat about stuff to get outside of the echo chamber. Uh, and, and it's not just a social outing. I really find that it helps me keep growing grounded to sort of a, a human empathy where if I just stuck with the people that agreed with me and that were in the same industry as I was, um, I wouldn't get the, the bigger perspective on what's going on in the world. And there's a lot of craziness in the world right now, and especially in my part of the world in the, in the United States. So it's nice to have a bigger group of people to get outside of that chamber. Uh, so those are the things I do that kind of keep me from going insane because I run at a pretty fast pace and I need some stuff to help me to stay grounded and, and, and keep my eyes above the water, if you will. Mm. So that, that's, uh, that's uh, a little bit about me when I'm not writing code. I do some of that stuff. Uh, as far as kind of my background, as you said, kind of filling in the gaps. So um, I've been... Uh, a developer for about 20 years. I was one of those rare people that decided uh, before, like way back in middle school, what I wanted to do. And I, I actually kind of did it. I went and studied that in college and became a developer. Um, so I've been doing that for a long time. And about five years ago, I began to realize that I wasn't very fulfilled just working on other people's code. Um, and I I realized through a through a long chain of events that actually what I wanted to do was teach. And so I became a teacher of software development, and that's what I currently do. And essentially, I, the way I describe this is I'm, I'm on a journey learning about development, in particular JavaScript, and just bringing other people along with me. So uh, that's kind of how I approach stuff. So over a 20-year career, I'm sure you've seen your fair share of good and bad situations. 
Kyle, can you tell me about the worst experience you've ever had on a project? I can go all the way back to the beginning. My very first software developer job, I had other tech jobs, tech support and things like that. But the first time I had a company take a bet on me and say, yep, we can hire you as a developer. Um, I had moved to a new city. So it was kind of a big deal. Like, okay, I've got this, I've got this job. I'm actually officially a software developer. I was kind of fresh out of the computer science education and I was still steeped in all of the object-oriented, class-oriented. This is how we model the, the, the business world with classes. And, and they threw me right at a problem and they said, all right, you're the sole developer, top to bottom, everything <laughs> on an app. You get, you get to do it all. Go for it. And it was essentially a year-long project to build... Um, it was pretty intimidating for a first job, but it was a year-long project to build... Uh, uh, an accounting software, basically payroll management and timesheet application software for a for a biotech company, and I was like, "Cool, I got this. I, I know I know programming. I'm I'm a CS grad. Let me at the code." And so I, I just jumped head head first into modeling all of this stuff like a timesheet was an object that was a collection of day objects that was a collection of these others, and I. <clears throat> I had all the polymorphism and all the all that stuff that I had learned in school and had read about. I now got to do, and I was, <clears throat> you know, just running at it. And I I worked on, like I said, I worked on this code base for about a year. We built the whole thing out, and then as we were, you know, rolling it out to train to, I think there were four or five hundred employees at the time. Um, people loved it. They they thought it was great, and and I was excited. It was like a kind of a success, and then. Um, we we got into the first timesheet period and people were submitting it and everything was great. And then the accounting department came back and said, okay, this is awesome. So we now have a bunch of, you know, people have been entering their data and, and whatever, but, but now we need some reports. We need you to give us the data back. And I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me that I would need to support that use case, but it hadn't. <laughs> and I was like, that's that, no problem. I got the, I got all this object stuff. I can very quickly set up some loops and instantiate the objects and dump the data out. We're good. So I wrote, you know, some quick little code to do that. And they ran the first report <clears throat> and it took 17 minutes oh, to wow. export <laughs> the data and the, the system almost crashed. And, um, it was kind of, it was kind of one of those literal like crash and burn moments where they said, <laughs> wait a minute, how could you have not thought that you were going to need to get the data out and not accounted for that in your data model and in the way that you interact with this stuff? How could that have not occurred to you? And I'm like, you know, I, I didn't realize this was going to be this kind of a problem. So it was kind of a crisis mode because this software <clears throat> was designed to solve a particular use case and it did that well. But if they can't get the data out, then there's no point. Um, and the, the, the problem ended up being that <clears throat> I was using a system to, uh, this was written in PHP and some JavaScript. And basically, in theory, when you instantiate a single timesheet object, no big, no big deal. But when you have an interpreted system like that, or you know, a, a dynamic system like that, if you start creating like 400 of them all at the same time. That's a lot of churn of, of memory and CPU. And so the, the theory of how to work with stuff on an individual databases did not scale to the theory of how to work with stuff on a, on a bigger, you know, an, on a bulk basis. And this was only 400. I mean, I, can you imagine if we'd had thousands of employees, it, it, it would have never worked. So I, I learned a very valuable lesson there that, um, while it's important to put your head down and kind of go at stuff, you know, little by little, we, we have very much that agile mentality, move fast, break things, that sort of stuff. We didn't call it that way back in the day when I was working on this, but I definitely agree that there's value there. And I'm glad that I wrote the code and I built an application. I got a lot of experience, but somebody at some point needs to have the bigger picture in mind. 
And a lot of times we get so myopically focused on stuff that we paint ourselves into these corners. So I learned that very valuable lesson that even though class oriented was, you know, it was great on an individual level, it did not suit what we needed to do on a bulk level. And that was, that was painful. You know, I had a lot of work very quickly to reorganize that data model so that we could dump the data better. Uh, It was, it was interesting. Yeah, that top level overview is incredibly important. And uh, I mean, you were in the thick of it. You saw exactly what happens when, when you just don't have that overview. Now, at an individual level, what do you use on a daily basis? Is, are there any methods, tools or services that you're using that you just couldn't live without? Well, I wish I had um, some more brilliant articulated answer, but I'm, I'm just going to say the most basic of things. I'm actually very much a kind of a... a a bottom up approach. I don't use a lot of tools. I don't use a lot of methods on top of stuff. I work from the, from the least amount and, and only add when I need stuff. So a lot of people that, that you may speak with would kind of be that they could give you a big old long list of every tool they use and every process they have their whole build process and all that. I'm kind of the opposite, but, but I will say that absolutely positively I could not get away without having and regularly like very regularly using source control like git um, I, I use git as a process to manage my thinking through uh, what I'm working on um, to to instead of like a local undo in my editor or something like that I mean I, I use git on a very regular basis I'm constantly committing and in a bigger sense um, it kind of flows with the way that I approach software development which is that software development I think fundamentally should be a collaborative task we're really good at individual just just let me at the code I'm gonna like put my head down and work on it but the way that I look at coding and the way that I look at open source I feel like we're missing out whenever we have the mindset as an individual or even as a a team of developers at your company. When you say the the thing that I can create, I've got to create the best version of it. And then maybe once it's like perfect or close to perfect, then I'll put it out there for other people to see. But a lot of people won't open source stuff because they're like, well, it's not good enough yet. You know, it's not mature enough for me to give to other people. And I have the exact opposite approach. I start out every new project with an open repo, an empty file. And as soon as I start writing some code, I immediately start committing to it and pushing it public. Um, so I de- I develop in the open, if you will. Now, I don't get a lot of feedback or direct collaboration while I'm writing on these projects. I wish I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reason I push it out there is because my assumption is that every line of code that I write is the worst possible version of that code. (laughs) And the only possible way for me to get it to be better is to have other people help me. So I'd rather push it out as quickly as possible. I'd rather say, I know it's bad and I need help. Then hold on to something, hoard something and say, no, 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 I'm going to get it perfect. Before I put it out there, I'm going to get it perfect. Why not push it out there as quickly as possible? And to me, that's what open source is about. And that's what about that's the collaborative nature of what I think we ought to be doing so get is that it's that vehicle for me it sounds silly but it I could not push stuff out as quickly as I do and as incrementally as I do if I didn't have a powerful tool like that to support it and so that that fundamentally I I don't I don't see how I could be a developer without being able to do that yeah and I, I think there's a lot of people out there who'd be terrified to put their code out in the open like that when it may end up being a springboard for a whole range of new opportunities. You know, I actually, I, I actually have, <laughs> I have a thing that I say about this, and sometimes it ruffles a few feathers. But um, a lot of people think it's this, it's the sort of imposter syndrome stuff. Like, um, well, you know, I don't feel like I'm good enough to put my stuff out there. If I do, people will realize that I don't know what I'm doing. That sort of thing. Um, and I'm sure there is some component of that at play. But but honestly, I think there's something else at play. I like to tell people that if you're not willing to put your code out, it might be because you have too much confidence in your code and in your own abilities, as opposed to saying, 
I know for a fact myself, Kyle Simpson, that I don't have what it takes to get this perfect. I have to put it out there. Um, so if somebody's hoarding that, it might be because they don't know how bad their code is or they don't know how much they need other people's help. Um, so I think there's I think there's a little bit of that component too. So Kyle, in your daily work, where do you still meet frustration? Where do you feel that there's room for things to be done in a more effective way? Yeah, I um that's a great question. I I feel like the biggest problem that we have and and I'm obviously biased as an educator here, but I feel like the biggest problem that we have as a as an industry and it's still I still run up against it, even though I know about this and work on it. I think the biggest problem that we have is that we're not appropriately balancing the idea of abstraction with the way that we write our code. I think a lot of us um, in the industry um, go a little bit too far and, and maybe sometimes a lot too far with the idea that, oh, somebody's created a new tool, a new application, a new um, uh, pattern or technique or something like that. I can drop this new thing into my process and all of a sudden there's a set of things that I used to have to think about and now I don't have to think about them anymore. It just It's automated for me. Um, it seems like every day somebody comes out with a new tool or a new framework that does something like that for them. And I very much agree that we have to have better tools to enable us to be better. It's, it's an augmentive sort of process. We need to augment our own capabilities capabilities with smarter tools. And I'm excited when we get those kinds of things. But I think what happens is that we become so reliant upon the augmented part that we stop even knowing what's happening under the covers. And that begins to betray the whole purpose of what abstraction was originally about. Abstraction was not originally designed as a way to hide away a detail so that you never have to see it again. Abstraction was actually designed to make it easier to see all of the parts. Taking a thing that was highly uh, complected, highly wrapped up, braided together, and separating it out into its constituent parts and creating a clean semantic boundary between them meant that you could go to either of those parts and fully focus on and understand it better than when it was all wrapped up together. That's what abstraction was supposed to be about. But what we've done is treat it as I create this layer and wrap a black box around a thing and then I don't have to think about it anymore and I don't care how it works. And I think we've lost a lot along the way, little by little. Every little decision like that that made us a little bit faster at getting our code shipped made us a little bit less capable of understanding what was going on under the covers. And we have um, some symptoms, not real not the real problem, but we have some symptoms of this when people complain about um, the burnout that exists um, in you know JavaScript fatigue is what it's often called these days. When they complain about them, they say, oh my God, there's so many tools and I can't learn all of them. I want to tell you something. I deeply feel this. I really deeply feel this because I don't use all of those tools. And every time I read a new tutorial about some new thing, there's 1,500 things in there that people are talking about that I have the foggiest clue. If I were to take a job interview today, I would fail most <laughs> modern JavaScript interviews because they would start out by saying, all right, well, go ahead and set up your like Webpack and your Babel and your this and your, 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 your all this other stuff. And I'd be completely lost because I don't use a lot of those things on a regular basis. <clears throat> and the reason I don't is because I focus on understanding each of those steps and understanding them better. A lot of people, for various different reasons, don't have the luxury of that. And so what they do instead is say, well, I'm just going to throw the tool in and stop thinking about it. And so they get to the point where they're, they're, you know, they're tracking with it and they're like, okay, that tool helped and that tool helped and that tool helped. But everybody has their limit at which their, their cognition level is so separated that now they're like, oh, I don't even know what to do now. I like, oh, you've, you've got two different um, packaging systems that I have to 
use at the same time. I, I got it when where there was one, but now there's two and I, I'm over my limit. So when people hit that fatigue part, it's not just the number of systems, but the fact that along the way they've given up so much understanding that they start to erode their own confidence. That I think is the root the root problem here. Yeah, I mean if you if you take a look at jQuery specifically on Stack Overflow. There are countless questions on how to solve a problem using jQuery and not vanilla JavaScript. It's, uh, I don't know, I just feel it's a symptom of the reliance we have on all of these new frameworks we introduce into our projects. I think we could increase the confidence and therefore decrease the level of fatigue that people feel as all of this great innovation keeps happening. If at every step along the way, we encouraged people not to use a tool so that they don't understand it, but to use a tool so that they can understand it better. And that I think is the disconnect. We use tools to make us faster at shipping code. And that I think is the wrong approach. We should be using tools to help us focus better on the stuff that is important not to not focus on stuff um, mm. and so I think <clears throat> I think if developers would take a step back and say every part of my stack is something that I should be aware of every part of my stack is something that I should have some deeper awareness of I should dig into that source code and understand how it does what it does so that when something breaks I'm not completely at a loss I'm not like well I guess stack overflow is my only option I mean I want to have I want to have more confidence over it. I want to have confidence over the code that I write knowing that it will do exactly what I want and that's what I, I hope for and aspire for for other developers. So I would say in, in, in answer to your earlier question, I think that's the big problem that I face is that I can't keep up with all of that stuff because I'm focused on understanding every little bit and therefore I'm, I lag way behind the innovations and, and I get further and further from being able to communicate with people because now when people ask me questions, they don't ask me about JavaScript anymore. They ask me about Webpack or React or Redux and I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm like years behind that. I'm still trying to figure out the underlying stuff. Well, now to flip it around on you there, in terms of all these new projects, libraries, and frameworks, is there anything that you are excited about at the moment? I do, th I do think there are some really interesting things that are happening right now. Um, I think it's really cool what's going on with code splitting and tree shaking. I've, I've thought for years that we needed to look at frameworks, not at, like, let me take a step back. The notion that people talk about when they say, I ship a React application to production or Ember or, you know, whatever. To me, that always seemed <clears throat> a little strange to ship a framework to production. Because if you've been around long enough, you know that the original source of these frameworks was not as a runtime platform, but rather the original source for, or the original motivation for frameworks was <clears throat> rapid prototyping. Pro frameworks were supposed to be useful for scaffolding a project, and then you took the scaffolding away, and what you were left with was the project. And if you think about it from the CSS world for a moment, the, like, for example, Twitter Bootstrap, Twitter Bootstrap, I guess it's just called Bootstrap these days, but Bootstrap is this great CSS file. It ships with all these different rules for buttons and other kinds of widgets. And it's a great rapid prototyping tool. I know a lot of developers that are designer developers that will start with Bootstrap and just start prototyping, dropping buttons and select boxes and other widgets in place. And they can, they can lay out an interface pretty quickly with something like that. And there's, of course, a million others too, but I'm just using Bootstrap. But those same people that talk about using a tool like that, if you ask them, well, well do you ship Bootstrap CSS, the one megabyte CSS file, do you ship that to production? They'd say, oh God, no, absolutely not. I'd never ship that CSS file to production. I use it to start with. And then when I'm ready to like go to production, I make a pass through and I strip out all the stuff I'm not using and I customize and I pull out only the things that I need. Well, why is it that we do that so naturally in the CSS world? But with JavaScript, we're like, oh yeah, I just ship the whole thing. Just ship all of it. I, you know, who cares? Throw it over the, over the, over the wall and, and let the user deal with it. And, and 
when you are in Silicon Valley and you have Google Fiber, Gigabyte Internet everywhere that you go and, you know, your mobile phone is like, you know, an $800 device that has, uh, you know, amazing connectivity in the basement of your building or whatever. Like if you're in that world, what difference does it make if you're loading megabytes worth of JavaScript? But I, in my position, um, traveling all over the world, I see a lot of people that live in a very different world than we do. We are in this cocoon when we build the web here. You know, I pick a lot on the United States because I live here, but we're in this cocoon where we think everybody has free access to bandwidth, free access to power. Um, there's a lot of places in the world that people don't have free access and unlimited access to electricity. They have to pay by the amount of usage of electricity they get. So charging their cell phone completely is a thing they have to budget for. And we don't even think like that here in the States. And so um, I, I think a lot more about that just because I've had an opportunity to see different parts of the world. And I, I think we should pay a lot more attention to only shipping what's necessary. My view on what makes a great app is an, a great app is an app that has absolutely what it needs and not a single bite more than what it needs. But we like to ship things with the whole framework in place in case later we might need to do a thing differently. Well, that's a lot of waste. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the frameworks we use don't really let us... Um, easily go in like we could with CSS and just strip out the stuff we don't care about. There's a lot of frameworks that claim to be modular, but they claim modularity just because they have separate files. Modularity is not about having separate files. Modularity is about having totally separate dependencies that are uh, can be pulled out and the whole system doesn't come crashing down. And that's not as easy in modern frameworks as we might like to believe. So, I, I, so getting back to the the earlier point, because I felt that particular pain point for a long time, I've been excited to see that we're getting smarter and smarter tools that let us figure out all the crap that we're shipping that we don't need to ship. If developers can't do it on the front end, if they can't, because of their frameworks, they can't go through and, and take out what they want. You know, People used to use Backbone a lot, and now it's totally uncool in the developer <laughs> world to talk about Backbone. You're like, oh my God, what an old school developer. Nobody uses Backbone anymore. I loved Backbone. But you know what I loved Backbone for? Is that Backbone was able to be configured exactly the way you wanted, and you could rip out all the stuff you didn't want. It, it was truly modular in a lot of respects. Now, there's a lot of crap that's not good about Backbone, but that part was really good. It was nailed really well. And I give a lot of credit to the folks that made that project um, for that because I think we need more of that. I think we need more of that flexibility to pick and choose the stuff. Now, the downside was if you lined up 10 Backbone developers, you'd get 15 different answers on what makes a Backbone app. <laughs> Everybody did it differently. But, you know, th that having the ability to make that trade-off is useful. There are some platforms nowadays where it's like there is one way or, you know, GTFO, man. There, like there's one way to do stuff. And if that doesn't work with the way you think about stuff, find a different framework. And so I, I like that flexibility and I like the ability to do it. So these tools like tree shaking and and uh, code splitting and stuff like that, where we can strip down to the bare minimum in a more automated way. I think that's I think that's really really cool. So I'm excited about that, um, and uh, I hope we see a lot more of that stuff happening. And I think what's happening is it's really it's really bringing the focus back on the user. I mean, ultimately, what tree shaking and those techniques are doing, you're optimizing your code for the user and for their experience. Now, Kyle, with all of these new languages and libraries that are coming out, how do you make time to learn new things and, and how do you stay up to date? Um, the simple answer is I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't keep up with all this stuff and I, I wish I did, um, but I, I just frankly don't. And so to, to answer that in a more tangible way, I work on my own projects and um I do so because I'm using that development 
process the things I'm doing. Like just, just for example, like this is going to sound so trivial to everybody else. Cause I'm sure anybody listening is like, Oh my God, I've done this like a year, you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> I have never set up code coverage before I've had test you know, things, but I've never set up using Istanbul, for example, mm. to, to test how much coverage I'm wearing. And I just recently released a library. Um, it's called FPO, FPO. Um, it's a, a functional programming library for JavaScript, but it allows named argument style. And uh, I just, re- you know, released this library and I said, you know, if I'm ma- going to make a library, I should like be more mature about this. I, I should have a unit test suite, you know, and be like official about it. And, and I should use like Travis CI. I'd never set up Travis CI before. I've been in this industry forever and, and I got passed up because to me, I didn't need something that official. So I never set it up. I was like, all right, well, I guess modern, like mature projects, if, if you, you need a badge on your readme, if people are going to take your project seriously. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go learn Travis CI. And, and it was actually pretty easy. I didn't need to do a lot. It was pretty cool. I looked at another project and, and dropped it in, but then I was like, oh man, that badge where they like say that they have like 96.23% coverage. That would be cool. What do I need to do that? So I'm like, I'm, I'm looking through and I'm trying to figure out Istanbul and like how to get it to, you know, integrate with my unit test suite. And I throw Istanbul at it and it comes back with some kind of like syntax error thing. And I'm like, well, I'm out of luck. Like, I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> Everybody else probably knows, oh, you just got to like set this property here. I'm lost. And I'm, I, I, to right now at this moment, still don't have that working because I don't know how to do it. And I'm as stuck as everybody else. I'm like out in the ether, like on Stack Overflow or posting an issue on the project or whatever. I, there's no magic <laughs> sauce here. I'm as lost as everybody else. But, but what I will say is that I am, I am glad for that opportunity. I am thankful for the opportunity to learn something more and to have a better idea of stuff. I, in a sense, you could say I haven't had the privilege of learning Travis CI and Istanbul before because I haven't had a need for it. And now, as I was trying to take that FPO project a little bit more seriously and try to get it a little bit more credibility, I have the reason to learn that thing. So that's the way I do stuff. And it maybe isn't great advice in like a general sense, but I wait. I'm, I'm, I'm just in time learning. I wait until I really need to learn a thing and then I learn it. And I'm not just gonna learn just barely enough to get the thing going. I'm really going to learn what Istanbul does and how it works. And I'm going to try to figure out Travis CI and see if I can push on its edges and get more out of it. I'm, I'm not going to treat that as a black box because I chose to bring that into my sphere of understanding. Now I'm going to try to learn that thing. I still have the foggiest clue what, how Webpack works. So if you <laughs> ask me about Webpack, I don't know, but but this is one little thing that I've chosen to bring into that sphere of, of my understanding. And I'm going to treat it like everything else, which is a thing that will help me be better, but also a thing that I need to understand, not just a thing that I use. So You Don't Know JS has had an incredible impact on the way that people think about JavaScript. Carl, for you, which aspect of programming has had the most impact on the way that you think about and write code? I think... <clears throat> These days, I would have to say functional programming. Um, I, I just recently finished um, the draft of my next of my latest book. It's not part of the You Don't Know JS series. It's a separate book. The book's called Functional Light JavaScript. Um, I have, for more than a decade, wanted to understand what all the cool kids talk about when they talk about functional <laughs> programming. And I would like sit at the kiddie table and look up at the adults and be like, "Wow, they just like <laughs> they can talk." about code in so much more sophisticated and mature of a way because they're functional programmers. And I'm like, well, I use functions in my code, so am I a functional program? Like, that is how naive I was for so many years of my career. And I, I set out a few years ago to finally really get my head around this thing. And, um, and, and that wasn't like a oh, I flipped the switch and now I, it's not like in Matrix where you just plug in and oh, now I know, you know, Kung Fu or something. Like this has been a long drawn out process for me. And so what I decided, just like I said earlier uh, in our discussion, that's a journey for me. And I thought, well, why don't I bring people along on that journey with me? Because maybe there's some other people out there that are 
of the same, you know, persuasion or they're similar, or maybe they're a little further along and they can help me or I can help them. So I just decided to, you know, start writing this book just like I did with You Don't Know JS. I, I wrote the book in the open. I started describing the fundamental concepts that I was learning. I was trying to articulate those in a way that was not wrapped up in all the formal terminology or notation or whatever, but I was trying to say, you know what, this is super intuitive. This like helps us write better, more readable code. And then I started realizing I need a better definition about better. Like we need a metric for better. <laughs> and what, what is that metric when it, when you're talking about functional programming? And so I, I kind of, this is not the like official um, endorsed answer that there'll be real, I'm not a real functional programmer, but there are real functional programmers out there that might roll their eyes at me. But I would say that the, the why functional programming, why is that useful is functional programming improves our ability to express code in a way that the reader of our code does not have to re- execute the code in their mind to know what it's going to do. We use patterns that are mathematically proven and well known. And if people know that when they read your code, they see a part of your code using some pattern or idiom, and they don't have to think about that part deeply anymore. They don't have to execute that code mentally to figure out what it's going to do. They can look at it and say, I know what it's going to do because I know it's using this proven principle. What I think that does for people, I think that is a powerful way of making code more readable, aka better. Because what it does is it frees up the reader of the code to focus on the part that's actually most important. That's the custom stuff. We, we have, when you write a code base and it's got, you know, a million lines of code, like 995,000 lines of that code doesn't actually matter to the reader. But when the reader gets into that million line code base, they haven't the foggiest clue what they need to pay attention to. So they have to execute every one of those lines of code in their head to get their brain around it. You know, researchers have studied that we spend as developers as much as 70% of our time just reading code before we ever get to write a line of code. 70% of our time. Because we write so much code and the reader of our code doesn't know what they need to pay attention to and what they don't. So I think functional programming is about writing code that people don't need to read in, a, in the most coarse of senses because they can glance at it and recognize it. And they say, well, I know what a compose does. I don't need to, I don't need to rethink about that. Okay, they're composing those functions. Great. Or, or I know what a, you know, a reduce does. Great. I'm, I'm good with that. And that has been transformational for me. But I should point out that um, I'm not a functional programmer. Um, so you have to take this all with a grain of salt. Um, I'm just trying to make my code a little bit better and bring other people along on that journey. I'm not top down switching completely to functional programming. And now my code is all full of monads and endo functors and that. like, I don't even know what that stuff is, but what I am trying to do is write code. That's a little bit easier for people to read. So I take JavaScript the pragmatic stuff that I ship working code with, and I try to improve it little by little. That's what Functional Light JS is about. It's about helping you go from the ground up to be a little bit better. It's not an all or nothing for me. Um, and I, I think that readability, optimizing so that a person can understand your code, even if they don't know the problem, and even if they've never read it before, that is a deeply important um ethic that I wish more programmers had. And, and I, I obsess about that these days. So all the books that I've written up to this point, they're all about helping you learn stuff better. Functional like JS is the same way. It's about helping you understand how to use those principles to make your code more readable, more verifiable, more trustable. I like to tell people, if you can't trust a piece of code, 100% to know it's going to do what you want, then you don't understand that code. And vice versa, if you don't understand a piece of code, you can't trust it. So for me, for me, functional programming is about, uh, you know, fixing that gap. And I think for a lot of people, it's super intimidating because functional programming, you hear about functors and mon monads and, and all these abstract terms which sound terrifying at first, but the reality really is that if you just learn a little bit about map, filter, and reduce, 
that has a huge impact on how you can write code. And it's a, it's a nice, gentle introduction to functional programming. And with that, we've come to the end of our first segment. Kyle, I'm about to throw some quick fire questions your way. Let's do this. Awesome. I got my seatbelt on. I'm ready to go. <laughs> what is the best advice about programming you have ever received? Um, the best advice that I've ever received is, um, that's, that's a good question. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of advice about code before, and I think the best advice that I've ever received is the, the Yagni, um, the you ain't going to need it sort of approach. Don't be so quick to assume that you might need a thing. So you're going to put a bunch of extra stuff in place just in case, but don't go so far as to say, I'm going to be myopic. So I guess the best advice is kind of the balance between obsessing about all these layers of abstraction too early, the premature optimization, if you will, not just about performance, but premature optimization of, uh, of, of, pro- of a project. The balance between that premature optimization and the very myopic of Yagni somewhere in between the two is how you it's how you really get pragmatic with code and I, I I'll go so far as to say I think maybe the best advice that I've ever given um, because it's the advice that I in, first internalized for myself um, is this <clears throat> you should understand whatever layer of the stack that you work out you should understand that layer at a pretty good deep level and then the layer below the layer of abstraction or the layer in that stack below so if you're a javascript developer you should really understand javascript the layer below that for us would be c for example system level programming you don't need to be an expert in that but you should have a basic competency at that so whatever level of abstraction that you play at be a master of that level and be competent at the one below it I think that's how most developers will will have the best success in their career. Mm. Kyle, which personal habits do you attribute to writing better code? Let's see. Personal habits. (laughs) I wouldn't say that I necessarily have a lot of great personal habits around (laughs) writing better code, but I would say that I am constantly doing of of a a sub-audible narrative in my head Um, of how I would write about this code. If I were going to write a book or if I were going to stand up and give a talk to describe this code, what would I say about it? How would I describe it? And when I look at my code and I'm like, uh, that would be confusing to people if I tried to describe it, then I know that that code is not where it needs to be. I need to go back and rename some variables. I need to reorganize it or whatever. So I don't know if this is like a personal habit. It's a little bit more like an OCD almost, but (laughs) I can't turn off the fact that as a teacher, I'm always thinking about everything that I write. How would I teach that to somebody else? Even if you listening are not, don't have the word teacher in your job title, I think you should and can teach other people by writing blog posts, by giving brown bag lunches at work, by doing code reviews and helping people learn a little bit better along the, along the way. So I'm always thinking, if I were trying to teach somebody else this thing, how would I describe it? And when that, when that answer doesn't sound good, then I know that that code needs to be made better. Mm. If you could recommend one book to join You Don't Know JS, what would it be and why? I would recommend the book Human JavaScript, um, and it's written by a bunch of really smart folks at a company called Andyat. So big shout out to them. In particular, Henrik um, is kind of the main author of that book. It's a fantastic book. What I love about it is that it's very, very different from the way that I approach explaining programming. It is very, I would I would almost go so far as to say it's very high level um, in its approach. The idea here is, What's what's the stuff that we need to talk about in the language and the and not the language itself but the patterns of how we use the language that will make us most effective as a team? What how can we do that? What is that layer? It's a meta layer on top of the programming language. How can we use this to make inner team communication more appropriate? Um, 
And so they use a set of patterns and they lay forth a, a framework in there that, um, that helps that work better. Um, I just think that it's a great book to round out people's perspective on the language um, in a much more kind of pragmatic sense because a lot of us have to work on teams with other people. We're all human beings. So having that layer to the language is pretty important. And I, I think they nailed that. I think it's a great book. Awesome. Kyle, who in the front end world do you look up to? Who's doing work that's really inspiring? Unsurprisingly, I would answer this question with two people that are in the functional programming world mixed with JavaScript. Uh, the first one, um, I, I think this guy is like my personal hero, um, Brian <laughs> Lonsdorf. Um, he is the author of uh, Professor Frisbee's Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming. So a lot of people know him. He is doing the tech editing on my book and has been an unbelievable resource to helping me, um, helping me figure out what the hell I'm doing? Because honestly, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know this stuff, but he's been such a, so he's a friend, but he's also just such a, a mentor in the, in the respect of knowing this stuff. And he's so good at mixing the communication level from the, I'm, I'm up on this mountain and I understand stuff you don't, but here's, here's how I can make that more palatable. Um, so I just, I love what he's doing. And I hope that what I'm doing is is complementary to his efforts. He's fantastic. Uh, the other guy, uh, I would I would call him my spirit animal um, <laughs> because I wish I wish I were this guy. Um, is Matthias Johansson, MPJME? Mm-hmm. Um, he does the Fun Fun Function podcast series. Um, I just. I fall all over myself loving. I just love his personality and his style and he, and the way he breaks down something so complex into a, you know, a bite sized piece that people can get. I just, I love that guy. And I I wish, I wish I was even a little bit like him. He's fantastic. (laughs) And let me mention one other person, I guess, that is, that is really valuable to our community right now. And that'd be Dan Abramoff. Um, I'm not in the react community. And so I'm totally on the outside, but this guy, uh, Dan is really fantastic about balancing pragmatism. Every time I see some thread or a blog post or something come out where people are, you know, they're just like all in on something. And Dan is always there to be like, yeah, this is great, but here's like, here's the balance. Here's the pragmatism of it. I just, I, I, I really look up to that. He's done a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, he's real instrumental in, in uh, Redux and all that. So he's done a, a bunch of really fantastic stuff for the community. But I think what's best is that as a leader that people look up to and respect, he's helping set the pace for let's not go overboard here. Let's always keep keep in mind the bigger picture. Um, so uh, I'm a big fan of Dan as well. So let's rewind a little bit over here. Kyle, imagine you wake up and you have no recollection of ever writing code. With your knowledge of the tools, books, and courses available today, how would you go about learning to program from scratch? Wow. Um, That's supposed to be a quick fire question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Man, let me think. I, I, I mean, the most obvious is that I would start trying to learn programming by saying, um, what is my end goal of writing a program? Is my end goal of writing a program to get a thing done or is my end goal something bigger? And I think developers should aspire to that. Honestly, actually, now that you bring this this question up, this would be an amazing blessing if you could somehow wipe your brain and start over from scratch, but have the benefit of all of the resources that we have to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes and get the same jaded bad habits. I wish I could go back in a race like this. And what I would do is I would follow the people that say, understanding what you write before you write it is pretty important. Um, I've written that. Other people have you have given that advice before. So I would say the purpose of my code is to communicate with other human beings. And it's only an accidental secondary thing that it instructs the computer. And so I would, I would start learning. I would go through a path of learning 
to code from the perspective of how do I communicate with other people what my thoughts and my plans are here. The, the resources that I would use, um, I'd use the UDONO.js books and the other stuff that has been written for free. Some other great resources that people should use. Free Code Camp is fantastic. Big shout out to that gigantic community of people that are all pitching in to help other people. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. Um, code Academy and um, Khan Academy, those are fantastic ones as well. So I, you know, I would use those sorts of things and I would find somebody to mentor me. Um, I'd find somebody like a Brian Lonsdorf and I'd be like, dude, what do I got to do? You know, I'll pick up your drying cleaning or whatever. What do I got to do <laughs> to get you to teach me the stuff that you know? So that's how I'd go about it. Mm. All right, let's wrap things up today with a tip from you on how to work smart, the best way that we can connect with you, and then we'll say goodbye. All right, so a tip from me on how to work smart. Um, how to work smart is to say uh, that you should. Okay, okay. Let me let me let me say it this way, because I, I used to work with a, a coding school, a, a coding boot camp school, and when developers would ask me like what. Well, I only have so much time. What can I do? And what was my, my what was my advice to them? Well, my advice was this: um, don't let yourself be stuck for too long, but don't jump immediately to assuming that because you don't know it the first time, you're you're lost. Um, it is okay and actually a kind of a good thing for you to be stuck in that limbo for about five to 10 minutes where you're looking at a thing and you have no clue how to do it. And you kind of try a few things and it doesn't work right or whatever. That limbo, we get scared of that limbo and we immediately jump to, okay, I'm going to have to ask on, on Stack Overflow. But I think we should embrace that. So working smart is embracing that limbo, that uncertainty part, because that's where your brain is expanding. But then have a good place to go to get the right answer. Don't just take the first Stack Overflow answer. Have experts, have resources that you go to and, and get the right answer. And then make sure you kind of close the loop on how the right answer fits with how you were um, exploring it and see if there's some way that you can leave a clue in your code so that the next time somebody reads that piece of code, they're not going to be stuck in that limbo. They're going to see, oh, I get it. I've, I've connected A to B. I see what he did. Look for that opportunity. So be in the limbo, struggle with it because that struggle is good. It helps you learn. Get the right answer. Don't just settle for it works, but it's a house of cards and I don't know why and I'm going to hold my breath and hope that it works, right? Get the right answer, but don't just leave it there. Connect those dots. Leave a breadcrumb, if you will. And I don't just mean code comments, although those are useful, but leave a breadcrumb for the next guy or the next lady or, or whoever that comes along. Leave a, a breadcrumb for them to say, here's how you jump from A to B. This is the path I took and here's how you can do it too. And the best way to connect with you? Best way to connect with me, I've I've kind of pulled back a lot from social media presence. So I I used to be obsessed on Twitter and I've I walked away from Twitter for a while. So I'm not really on Twitter, but best way for to connect with me is on GitHub um, or on LinkedIn. I spend a lot of time on those networks these days and I would love to work with you on code. So come find me there. To everyone out there, you've been hanging with Kyle Simpson and Larry Buerta. Head over to fixate.it where you'll find links and timestamps for everything we've been talking about today. And of course, head over to Amazon or O'Reilly, get yourself a copy of the You Don't Know JS series and master JavaScript. Kyle, I want to thank you for sharing your journey with Fixate on Code. Keep pushing the limits and keep pushing great code. <laughs>